Hello, I'm Rod Grams, and welcome to the December edition of Washington Report. Well, as the House and the Senate wrap up the first half of the 104th Congress, it's obvious that the message of change has carried through from the 1994 elections. For once, politicians did keep the promises that they had made during their campaigns, and the most obvious example of our commitment is the Balanced Budget Act of 1995. Our budget is historic, not only because it is the first balanced budget Congress has submitted to the President in 25 years, but also because it preserves Medicare, reforms welfare, and it offers true tax relief to overburdened American families. Now, my special guest today has played a very active role in changing the way this government treats your tax dollars. Representative Jennifer Dunn of Washington is a member of the House Ways and Means Committee. She helped draft the tax relief legislation that will finally allow Americans to keep more of their hard-earned money. So welcome to Washington Report. Jennifer, thank you very much for taking your time to be with us. Thank and you, also, Rod. It's great to be back with a classmate. That's what I was just going to say. We were freshmen together in 1992, and it, it's just great to see the work that uh, the House has done this year. And I've, I've made a lot of jokes a lot of times in, in talking with people the first half of the year especially when they asked me how it feels to be a part of this new revolution in Washington, and I'd always say, I, I don't know I'm in the Senate. <laughs> because the House did a lot of the hard work. And, uh, but the Senate is, I think we've caught up quite a bit, and especially now we've got the balanced budget, importantly, uh, passed on and uh, now to the President. And of course, uh, we're now looking at a compromise. But uh, what about the success of the continuing resolution? I think we really have a commitment, I hope, Americans view this as a commitment. I know Republicans do. I hope the administration, especially President Clinton does, a commitment to a seven-year balanced budget. Well, we think he should consider a commitment, Rod, because as you say, uh, he, he wrote uh, the words in blood that he did agree to our continuing resolution, and mm -hmm. it simply said that we will agree to balancing the budget in seven years, and we will do that with good numbers, with real numbers, and accurate numbers. Mm -hmm. And he signed off on that, so I don't see any way he can get out of that agreement, although the very next day, as you recall, uh, his uh, chief of staff, Leon Panetta, was mm -hmm. talking about seven years, eight years, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure we keep him to that task. But I just wanted to tell you, you're doing a great job in the Senate, and, and uh, we are so proud of the freshman senators, some of whom come from the House, and uh, mm -hmm. all the work that you did in preparation to this balanced budget, uh, I still look on with awe. Uh, I'm a new member of the House Ways and Means Committee now in mm -hmm. the House, and uh, as a sophomore member, I've got a lot to learn, but mm -hmm. all these great ideas that we're talking about that we're finally going to get, I hope, get written down in stone mm -hmm. to balance the budget really came from a lot of the work that you did as you came in as a freshman. And a lot of it was part of our Family First Bill, the $500 right. per child tax credit and many others, the capital gains reduction, the senior citizens removing the earnings test, adoption penalties removed, uh, marriage penalties erased, uh, research and development to try to create jobs. I mean, a lot of people always say, and you'll hear this time and time again, tax cuts for the wealthy. Uh, but it's shown many, many times that the vast majority, over 80%, go to families making under 100000 a year. It's important for people to realize that. I think we can't say that enough, mm -hmm. because what we have seen is a very strong political line that we are creating tax cuts mm -hmm. for wealthy friends. Mm -hmm. But you look at the uh, child tax credit, for example, that mm -hmm. gives a... Uh, uh, a family with two working parents, for example, with children under the age of 18, $500 off the bottom mm -hmm. line of the taxes they owe. Mm -hmm. We got to get that into position very quickly because then they'll see that gain and they'll take that money that's saved and spend it on their children for clothes or for school lunches or uh, to put in a college fund. Mm -hmm. And it's our belief, Rod, and you and I agree on so many things, but particularly uh, it's our belief that people at home who earn the money can spend it much more wisely than anybody here in Washington, D.C. can. And, and there's a kind of a, a question out there, whose money is it? And I think people who get up and work 40 hours plus a week, where both husband and wife work, somehow should have a little bit more of that money that they can keep. And I believe they work very hard for it, and they should have the opportunity to make those decisions how best to spend it on their family, their education, their schools, uh, you know, everything that they want to do for their children, rather than having to give it up to Washington and then stand with their hand out and say, please give me some of this back. And, and the other part of that is I'm not so sure Washington knows how to spend money very wisely. They know how to spend it, but they not sure wisely. They sure do, and, and uh, the amount of bureaucracy I've seen in the, this is my third year back here, and, mm -hmm. and other areas, fraud, abuse, uh, misuse of money, 
uh, mandates on families to spend funds by sending them back to D.C. to fund programs that really aren't the uh, under the purview or shouldn't be of the federal government. Uh, this is all very bad. I think it creates a suspicion in people's minds that often is accurate. So we're really not sending money back to people through the child tax credit. We're leaving it where it started in the first place. We're giving these families a chance to use that money in the best way they see fit to make their families stronger. And when we talk about the balanced budget in seven years, many, many of the things that we as Republicans have written into our balanced budget act of 1995 are things that President Clinton in the last, since he began campaigning for president, since he has been president, has endorsed or has written about or has talked about or has campaigned on, such as a balanced budget. He had it in five years. He had a child credit of 800, a child credit of $1,000, uh, overhauling welfare, preserving uh, Medicare, preserving uh, Medicaid. These are all things that he has talked about and endorsed as well. So it's pretty hard. I mean, he can maybe find some wiggle room here, but I don't think Americans are going to uh, let either Congress or the president out of this commitment to balance the budget in seven years. And, and the American people have to keep the pressure on, mm -hmm. especially pre pressure on the president right now, because the Senate and the House have worked very, very hard through these last 10 or 11 months putting together mm -hmm. a package that is a terrific and strong package that's going to help the families in the United States. Uh, it's going to help business. It's going to help children. It's going to help older people. Um, and I think the president should buy into this mm -hmm. and take credit for a lot of it. We'd like to work together with him. The problem, Rod, that we've had lately, and I've seen it so directly since I've been on the Ways and Means Committee, and the president's people have come and testified on the tax cuts, on Medicare, mm -hmm. on welfare. <laughs> they don't have plans of their own. Uh, they talk in generalities, right. and so we need to see those numbers from them. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's what we need to do before we can really sit down at the table and figure out where the agreement must come, where the, the points are that we, have to, uh, that we have to do some compromise on. Now we're looking ahead to December 15th, which is the next day that the CR runs out, and there's some talk that we might not be able to come to an agreement on a budget in that short period of time, which is only a few days away. And in fact, I've read articles already from uh, spokespeople from within the administration and out that uh, the, the president might believe that it might be just as well off politically for him not to come to an agreement on a budget to try work out a continuing resolution and let this go as a mandate. The budget should become the mandate for the 1996 elections. Now, I heard Representative George Geekus the other day made a comment. He said, I thought uh, the 1994 elections were a mandate right. for the budget that we have crafted. Yeah, we already did that. We've we don't need to it. do that again. We, we know what the people want. So does the president yeah. know. And I would not like that tactic. That would seem very political to me. And I think that's a, an example of their refusal to let go of the old ways, oh, the ways gosh. that have shown to have failed rather than yeah. being able to change. And we have example after example on, on why those old ways have not worked. I mean, you can look at welfare reform, for example, the, the generations of folks who have become dependent on the government. We know that doesn't work. The mm -hmm. answer is to get the decisions back to the local level. Let the local people uh, define what the real problems are in reforming welfare in their communities and then fund the programs that really mm -hmm. work. But uh, the first time in 40 years, Rod, we finally have a coalition of people together. Mm -hmm. It's not all Republicans. There are some Democrats involved in this mm -hmm. that understand the value of balancing a budget, uh, that have worked together to put a plan together, to do it in seven years, which we believe probably is the shortest amount of time we can do it with the least amount of pain, mm -hmm. where actually we're moving our spending over that seven-year period from nine and a half trillion dollars to twelve point two trillion dollars mm -hmm. uh, that is a huge increase in spending we're not cutting spending we're increasing it largely uh, it's much better than a straight freeze would be mm -hmm. but we've got the power to do it now we've got the majority controlling both bodies of the congress mm -hmm. to do it and so we've got to move forward and i hope that folks in your district as i'm encouraging folks in mine will put pressure on the president to come to the table uh, not to give uh, to pick up his walking stick and walk away is sit there and negotiate with us get this done and let next year's election uh, be an election about what's important then the values that we want to move on to now that we have set up a balanced budget projection and and I think as we move toward that in the 245 billion dollars in tax cuts that we're talking about 
and again this goes to the hard-working I think American families out there that deserve it and when they talk about the huge tax cut that we're trying to give but nobody ever talked about the 265 billion dollar tax increase right. in the Clinton budget as being a huge tax increase the biggest one in history we're barely making up for we're that with our cuts up. and I'll tell you that uh, as I talk to people in my congressional district uh, east of Seattle Washington uh, homeowners for example they don't think that the tax cut uh, that we call capital gains is a tax cut for the rich mm -hmm. they think that helps them out a little bit keep a little bit more in their pockets when they sell their homes mm -hmm. and uh, if we can move next year on to indexation for the sale of mm -hmm. homes that will be even better uh, but this is a tax cut uh, capital gains that affects small businesses and property owners and people who have invested in assets uh, for their retirement who want to see them gain in value so it's a it's a an important tax cut and it just uh, follows right along with your numbers that 80 percent of this kind of a cut goes to help people under an hundred thousand dollar a year income families and we know some of the tax laws have forced farm families out of business if one of the spouses died is forced uh, small yeah. businesses not being able to transfer from one generation to the other because the government is standing there taking such a big bite out of it that they can't afford to continue 54 percent typically yeah. and uh, with some of our estate uh, tax relief we've been able to keep a little bit more of uh, the profits that were made in the sales of a farm in the pockets of the owners when those owners die, when they leave those to their children, uh, our proposals would allow that home, that farm, that business to stay a small business and to be, to become a f small business instead of being eaten up by a huge corporation, which is uh, the result of these huge tax laws we have now that create a burden so that small companies can't pick up other small companies. And I, I think before we take a break here, we'll just emphasize that if we could move from today two or three years into the future and see the benefits of what this budget is going to do and and that is with lower cost and interest rates uh, more business investments which are going to be more jobs better jobs higher paying jobs uh, also things like removing the burden of debt I think that's the one thing that we really got to concentrate on from our children so the benefits are so immense if we can only get people to focus ahead on what right. not and the pain not so much of what it's going right. to take to get there or even just the goal of the balanced budget that's that's, right. that's not a goal in itself it's mm -hmm. a goal because of what it can provide for us if we can be spending two percent less in a mortgage uh, interest payment every month of every year for the children mm -hmm. of the future or the people who are becoming uh, folks who are going to be first-time homeowners, that's what we're talking about. That is the goal. Or you're going to see a lot, a lot of us refinancing to take advantage of a lower right. interest rate as well. We're going to take a break right now. We're, we'll be back in just a moment to talk with more of our special guest, Congresswoman Jennifer Dunn, right after this. Vince, that new dummy cam is great. Yeah, it'll sure give people a whole new outlook on what it's like when you don't wear a safety belt. Oh! Yeah! I think they'll get the picture. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. He protects all living things in the forest. But he can't do it alone. Please don't play with matches. Put out your campfires. And never, ever forget the words of Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent forest fires. And again, I want to welcome back uh, Jennifer Dunn, Congresswoman of Washington, a freshman colleague of mine in 1992, now moved into your sophomore year, and a member of the Ways and Means Committee. Now, this has been a very important uh, committee to serve on, one of the, the most powerful committees in the House. Uh, really puts you in a position of helping in a lot of the things that you have done, working on the new tax bill, uh, and also many of the reforms that you have been a leader on, uh, especially. Uh, in the last two years, from 92 to 94, and, and now since. So, Jennifer, a little bit about uh, your new role as a member of the Ways and Means Committee and your continued efforts on the reform. 
Uh, I have a truly new role, Rod. Since we came into Congress, uh, and you'll recall that those first two years, while you were served in the House with me, I was the only Republican from the state of Washington, and there were That's eight right. Democrat members of Congress. So now my new role is being den mother to six brand new Republican members of Congress. So from now Washington it's a seven state. to one. It's a complete seven reverse. Seven to two. Seven Isn't that two. stunning? Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful role to play. So I can be there in place to help my new colleagues in any way possible. But uh, what I what I did do as a result is I uh, took a look at what would be the best committee for me to serve on uh, for Washington State's interests and, and my own uh, interests and what I had done in my past and decided Ways and Means was a good committee to be on because I'm staunchly anti-taxes. Mm -hmm. And if you can get some anti-tax people on that committee and start ratcheting down the level of taxes people are paying all over the country, mm -hmm. you can leave that money at home and that money generates uh, lots of activity in the economy. So I've been involved in all the uh, tax relief package of the balanced budget and in Medicare reform and also in welfare reform. And have had a lot to learn for the last 10, 11 months, but it's been a wonderful learning curve and very energizing for me and uh, it's been exciting too to be just the fifth wim woman in history in over 200 years to serve on that committee mm -hmm. so it's a great honor for me. Now uh, you said what you did before what was the natural progression that took you from your private life in, into Congress? Um, I started out early in mm -hmm. politics in the sixth grade I was elected president of my student body the very first president mm -hmm. beat my boyfriend which made him unhappy but it was kind of fun <laughs> from my point of view and I just worked on went through uh, a lot of offices in school and girls state uh, it was an important part of my mm -hmm. high school education uh, on through Stanford University graduated and went right to work as a volunteer on political campaigns was always a Republican because that's a, the kind of family I came from a very solid, hardworking, conservative family. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to work after college uh, for IBM as a systems engineer and worked in the area of small business. So I installed many, many computers every time of day and night. So I know the schedule that small business people have to keep. And it was my first uh, mm -hmm. real foray into the problems that you run into when you're running a small business because I had to be in there programming all the changes mm -hmm. in payroll taxes and so forth. And I think that's been a breath of fresh air because many of the freshman members of 92, our class, uh, and uh, now the, a lot of the new freshmen of 1994 in the House, have been people that are coming out of the private sector, out of business, uh, private, uh, you know, owning their own business or, or employed or however, but it, it's not the professional politician. Not at all. And it's brought and a new breath of uh, uh -huh. And we're government. seeing this a lot now in mm. this brand new class in the 104th Congress, mm. too. Two-thirds of them have not been involved in holding right. political office. So they are from the, from the business area, and they're here for often for a brief period of time, some mm. of them six-year term limits, and they're going to go back and let somebody else come in with their energy and their dedication. I had been involved uh, before as a... Uh, uh, a tax uh, assistant in property taxes for my county assessor then I went on to run a state party organization for mm -hmm. number of years so I it was really like a small business because mm -hmm. we employed 15 people and we had to pay health care benefits and watch them move up and uh, but so I had some sense of what went on in the Congress but it was uh, really a wonderful challenge for me when I came to Washington DC in our class mm -hmm. to uh, to kick into high gear and to become what my title said I was a representative of the people from my district uh, the 8th congressional district in Washington State and I have enjoyed every single day of this experience and they haven't been easy days a lot of them very demanding but I feel so strongly about what we've got to do for our country that as long as my folks at home elect me, I'm going to be in there keeping the lid on taxes and making sure that our values are brought back in through uh, whatever the tax code can do to create incentives. And I think that's a feeling, and I know a lot of the, the new members are here for a purpose. They want to change things, but they want to change them for the better. They want to make a better future for their kids and their families. And they're taking a lot of tough votes, and uh, like you say, and a lot of them have intentions of only being here six years, maybe 12 years at the most, not to be a professional politician, but to make that input where they think it's important so when they go back home into private business or into their communities, that things are going to be a little better and that there's more emphasis on state and personal responsibility and decentralizing Washington. That's, that's, the, that's a really important focus that you bring up, Rod, mm -hmm. getting the power back home where people are more aware of the problems. The problems in Washington State 
uh, versus Minnesota, for example, and they're going to be very different. And these folks at home have had training. They're in the business sector. They're in the legislature. They're in uh, municipal offices, mm -hmm. and they can figure out what the problems are, but they also know what is the best way to solve them in their communities. So every chance we get uh, to make this federal government less invasive mm -hmm. and more responsive and to get the power and the money shifted back home, uh, that is part of the values of the system that we think will result in smaller government, therefore more effective government. Because the closer you get government to the level where the problems are or where the people are that you are serving, the better accountability you're going to have and the better programs that you can develop. Because a cookie cutter program out of Washington, like you said, uh -huh. if it applies to Minnesota and Washington State, it's not going to have the, I think, the best results that if you can tailor it a little bit better for Minnesota, tailor it for Washington. So at a local level, you need that type of an input. And uh, I tell a lot of people in talks that, uh, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, people ran for Congress as a stepping stone to get into state legislatures. Is that right? Because that's where the power was. That's where Good. people kept their money. That's where the decisions that really affected lives were made. And I think we've got to get back to that. I think it's time to get back home. And that's something I always support in any vote. States' rights are getting the power back home. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that Washington can do and does well, but not everything. And I think that's where the problem has been because uh, so much of that authority has been usurped over the years and taken from the local government, state governments, and brought to Washington as the only ones that could take care of these programs. We all know we need good government. We all know we're going to have to spend some taxes for some of the good programs and good services. But when we talk about are we overtaxed, yes. Does Washington provide the best service? In many cases, it doesn't. So what we need to do is reverse this trend in many ways to get it back to the local and state governments. We'll be back. We're going to take another break, and we'll be talking more with Congresswoman Jennifer Dunn of Washington right after this. Your approach is looking good, Cobra. The men and women in the National Guard and Reserve face some tough challenges when they serve. Challenges that teach them discipline, leadership, and technical skills that make them better employees. So when they need time off to serve, don't make their toughest challenge approaching you. My hero, Isaiah Thomas, Kevin Costner, Mr. Wong. These are teachers. But to the kids they've reached, they're heroes. My hero, Mrs. Wooten. If I don't get through to that child, who knows, maybe no one else will. Teachers have the power to wake up young minds, to be heroes, to make a difference. Reach for that power. Teach. Find out how by calling 1-800-45-TEACH. Be a teacher. Be a hero. Again, my special guest, uh, Congresswoman Jennifer Dunn of Washington. Again, Jennifer, thanks for being with us. My pleasure, Rob. I know well, this new Congress is a lot different, the 104th and the 103rd, and there was a lot of reforms that were made early because I know we talked a lot about that you have to change the way Congress does its work before you can change the product that comes out of Congress. And again, a lot of reform issues, and they started almost with day one in the House and in the Senate. They did, and the reason <laughs> for that is for the two years previous to um, to the time you began your service in the Senate, a lot of us had been on a committee called the Committee for the Organization of Congress, mm -hmm. which was uh, had as its purpose to look at the United States Congress and in a very bipartisan fashion to decide what changes should be made to cause this Congress to work better for, the, for all the people mm -hmm. in the United States, not just for one party or another. So it was led by a Democrat and a Republican as co-chairman. Half were from the Senate, half from the House, a uh, small committee, 24 of us. Mm -hmm. Met for six months, had hearings over and over, and tried to get our uh, proposals onto the floor of the House, but the previous uh, majority and leadership in the House of Representatives uh, would not allow us to bring it to the floor. So as a result, a lot of Democrat freshmen were defeated in this last election, and all of ours stayed on because we really wanted these changes. They, they were changes like the one called the Congressional Sunshine Act, one of my proposals, mm -hmm. uh, which had the effect of opening up all the meetings in the Congress to the public or the press. Uh, we put into a proposal about 10 of these changes, and on the opening day, Rod, that our party came into power last January, we passed every single one of these reforms, required that members actually sit in on hearings and be present, 
uh, during votes in a committee so that they'd see the essence of the legislation that was being discussed and change their minds if they heard a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, required our, uh, our being available uh, to our constituents and uh, to uh, everybody in our community uh, as to the way we'd voted on every single vote in the mm -hmm. legislature. We now publish that far more often than we ever did before. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing after another, we change so that, uh, for example, committee chairs could only serve for six years, and even mm -hmm. the Speaker of the House has an eight-year term limit. Right. But it caused people to be more invested in the system and have to literally be there and show up uh, to make good legislation. Accountability and oversight mm -hmm. is so important. And I think it's like any major company. After so many years, you've got to kind of tear back some of the layers that have built up, and you want to streamline. You can honor and respect the traditions and the way that Congress works, but there's a lot of things that have been added to it that can be taken apart. And that's the responsibility of new management that's when they right. step in. Take a look. Clean the closets mm -hmm. out. Let's get this thing working well for all people, mm -hmm. not just in a partisan way. We had many, many uh, votes from Democrats on that opening day, and they were relieved that we were willing to bring it to the floor and really get some of these things that needed to be changed out uh, before the public's eye. Before we go, I know we have just less than two minutes, but I'd just like to bring up one of the most uh, debated topics right now, and that is Bosnia. Uh, the decision by the president to send troops, uh, American troops, 20,000 plus, which will probably end up 40, 50,000 when you count support troops and everything else. And the debate going on in Congress, many of us feel that the president, while maybe starting to make a case, has not given us the specifics that would get us the support putting American men and women into harm's way. And, uh, this is a debate that's going to go on, I think, up until the day the president makes that final decision. Very disturbing in my mind, Rod. Uh, I think we have a moral obligation in both houses of this Congress to have and demand a full debate mm -hmm. on this issue of Bosnia. Uh, many of us believe we have not been given a clear, defined goal. Uh, and until we hear that, what the President's thinking is, what NATO uh, is going to mm -hmm. uh, suggest for him, um, putting our sons and our daughters in harm's way is not the way to solve this problem. Uh, the other thing that bothers me about Bosnia, many things do, but his definition of leadership requires that ground troops be in there, 20,000 of our young people in the way of the bullets. I don't believe that's true. I think we have uh, a leadership role to play that includes uh, advice and air uh, support mm -hmm. and uh, intelligence and satellite technology and all these other things that we do well. I'm not convinced at all and mm -hmm. would oppose it right now uh, that the president should send our young people to Bosnia to fight this battle. And we want the president to at least outline specifics so a year from now we don't change the mission that began this and year. And who knows if it'll just be a year. That's, that's, right. that's a and big problem. So in other words, we don't Too want to marks. commit ourselves to a slippery slope where we don't know yes. what's going to end. We're out of time. Again, Jennifer, thank you very much for taking your time to be been with me. It's been great us. to be with you, you, Rod. We'll see you again next month. Good day.